Charlie Wang and uh, doubts that you may you may have. No questions. That's good. Uh, I would like to uh, clarify a little bit things because uh, uh, many students separately send me uh, quite a few emails about the uh, baseline curves and the surfaces. So I would like to repeat as what I already announced during the lectures. And in the final examination, we'll not uh, cover the baseline curves and the surfaces. But the other types of uh, curves and the surface will be uh, covered uh, by the final examination. Okay. And uh, as suggested by uh, Dr. Polo Patolo, and uh, I would like to ask uh, one question for warm up. And um, so there's many, many guys uh, ask questions about the, how to obtain the uh, OBJ5 vertices. And I would like to ask her a question, like if I give you, I would rephrase this question in this way. If I give you a vertex of a, or for OBJ5 form, I mean, the, the 3D mesh, are you able to somehow uh, generate the face table? It's like usually the vertex table is given and then the, the most critical part is the face table. Are you already been familiar with how to generate a face table? I would like to give you one a very important tip. So it's like orientation of the vertices, the order of vertices in the face table is, is extremely important. Because if you're giving it in a wrong orientation, the two neighbor faces, they, are fa they will be interpreted as a face in different directions. Okay. And are you familiar with this already? If not, you'd better go back to checking the, the recorded tutorial section, which I, 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 I mentioned uh, during the, the tutorial section. And there is a question from Abbott about will generative design be covered? No, it's like generative design is a kind of extension of uh, L7 and will not be covered. Even the L7 will not be covered because L7 is already covered by our lab section. The lab report already covers the information from L7. Uh, Professor Wang, I had two questions following up to what you just said. Yeah, go ahead. So when making the face table, are we, the order that we follow, is that the right-hand screw rule where we go in an anti-clockwise direction? Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay, that's question one. Question two is, I noticed in some of your numericals, when you were calculating the tangent vector of a Bezier curve, you used the formula N times P2 minus P1. Right. Where I think N is the degree of the Bezier curve. So is that just a general formula for tangent vectors that we can use for all degrees of Bezier curves or is that not the case? Um, you mean the starting ending point or the middle of the curve? I think the starting point, yes. Yeah. Starting point, yes, exactly. Um, in that case for middle curves, should we use the more general formula that you've given? Uh, middle similar. curve is, I would say there's a slice in L5, let me open it a little bit. I, because basically the general form of a derivative of Bezier curve is another Bezier curve with one degree lower, right? So I would suggest you go to the page. Let me open my first notes. I think probably page Page 19 of L5. There's a general form on the top. And then that's that's generally how you evaluate anything in the middle. For example, 
if you are trying to evaluate the tangent in the middle, you just uh, substitute the u equal to 0.5 into that equation, and they will get in the, the solution. I see. And so if you wanted the n uh, tangent, for instance, you just put in u equals 1 then? Right. That's extreme. That's, that's ex it's an extreme case. So that's why you have n times p1 minus p0 and n times pn minus pn minus 1. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. Um, yeah. Thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. Here's the question. It's about the homework of L5, Q3. Uh, how can we get in P prime zero and P prime one? Exactly, that's a good question. Uh, also quite a few students sent me email to ask that. And I have to say that the solution I provided for uh, Q1 and Q3 for L5 example questions is just a, a solution, just like one solution. So basically, it's a design problem that how you determine the magnitude of uh, uh, the tangent at a starting ending point of uh, one particular curve which you want to approximate by a, a Bezier curve. So uh, turns out you can get given any of the other value of P prime zero, P prime one, as long as it's reasonable. So when I say reasonable, it's like the, the tangent direction must be the same as the tangent direction of a, a Hermit circle. And then the, the magnitude is actually determined by yourself, okay? Any other questions? Is everything clear from part one? Okay, there's a last question. Potion base surface with construction. Uh, no. The answer is clear, simple, no. Because the potion based reconstruction is a, a, it's a kind of a special case of a general implicit surface based reconstruction. So, as the implicit surface based reconstruction is, belongs to L7, as what I announced during the lectures, will not be exempt. Uh, will we need to compute Gaussian projection? Uh, is knowing the algorithm sufficient? I think knowing the algorithm will be sufficient. Will we expect it to write step by step of the algorithms? I have to say like if you are asked to design an algorithm, yes. You need to write in the algorithm step by step. Just like step one, do what? Step two, do what? Step three, if what happens, go back to step one and something like that. Written in steps will be good enough. You don't do not need to really written into your standard pseudocode. Last, another question so will the exam be similar to the style of the taking home questions? I have to say, uh, in certain level of similarity, that's why I keep asking you guys to uh, go through the example questions and the course notes because I can ensure like everything is going to be exam will be covered by the course notes and the example questions. There's a question from any, like, if we have to written out the steps, does it have to be full sentences or will bullet point the do? I think we'll simply uh, written those bullet points in, in the logic way, I think will be good enough. It's not a necessary, it's not necessary to written out the full sentences. Any other questions? If no other questions, I would pass the time to Professor Polo Bartolo.
Any other questions to Professor Charlie? Yeah, this is uh, this is good. So this is good. Sounds like you guys are, are revision very well. Okay, wish all of you good luck tomorrow. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Paulo. Bye. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, AM. And Uh, Professor, two questions on, I think, some of the past papers you've given us. Uh, there was a question on, I think, rapid freeze prototyping in one of the past papers. Is that going to be yeah. assessed or no? No, no, no. Sorry. I think that I, I circulated an email to all of you mentioning that um, uh, the rapid freeze process was not covered this year. And uh, there is also an exam question where I ask a question about um, uh, viscoelastic model. As far as I remember, it was a Maxwell model or something like that. And again, that was covered in uh, half of a lecture last year, but uh, not this year. So no. Okay, that's question one. Question two is in, again, one of the past papers, there was a 15 mark question where we were asked to calculate the build time of a photopolymerization process. We're given oh, okay. a bunch of various parameters. No, so again, uh, that uh, that question, uh, the topic of that question was not covered this year. No. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, but uh, but that is a good uh, a good question, uh, Eric. Because uh, yeah, in terms of um, equations, so if you ask me, can we expect some calculations in uh, the additive manufacturing? The answer is uh, probably yes. Now, basically, what are the, 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 the equations that you need to, to know? If you remember for um, the inject-based process, so material uh, jetting and the bio jetting, we have this uh, printability factor or printability uh, parameter. So you need to understand that equation. Then uh, for the powder bed fusion, there is uh, a couple of equations correlating uh, the build rate uh, with uh, laser power, volume. Uh, so this is something that you need to, to, to know. For that photopolymerization, there are several equations that uh, I mentioned to you. Um, some equations were related to the light intensity distribution on the surface of the resin and uh, across uh, the thickness. And those equations were the Bielembert law and uh, the Gaussian uh, um, equation. Those equations you don't need to, to know by heart and I'm not going to ask any uh, question where you need to use those, uh, those equations. Um, in the past, in, uh, in, uh, in an exam, I ask uh, about the variation of light intensity uh, at the surface of the resin and across the, the, the resin uh, thickness. And I ask, please uh, mention the models that describe such uh, uh, variation. But I'm not going to ask any questions where you need to use those uh, equations to calculate anything, which is not the case uh, uh, regarding the other two equations. So, so the equations related to the cure depth, uh, uh, related to the um, penetration depth, uh, those are equations that you need to, to know and you need to understand uh, and to know how to use uh, those equations. Um, okay, thanks for answering. There is, uh, there is uh, a question from um, Yusef. So question one. In VET photopolymerization, is the applied temperature constant from the start to finish, or can this be raised continuously so that it is always above the glass transition temperature? 
this is a very good question. Well, if you consider the, the, the fabrication process, so in VET photopolymerization, as you know, we have uh, what we call it as uh, conventional VET photopolymerization that uses uh, a UV light. So basically, we can adjust uh, uh, the energy by adjusting uh, the scanning speed. But uh, once we fix the scanning speed, the energy provided by the laser is constant. Uh, and that energy will induce a certain temperature on the polymer. In the case of uh, um, infrared stereolithography, we use uh, an infrared laser beam and uh, the effect of that uh, um, light is to produce heat. But again, the temperature um, depends on the scanning speed. And again, when we define a specific scanning speed, this means that the heat provided by the radiation is constant throughout the fabrication process. In the case of uh, stereothermal lithography, we have a combination of uh, UV and infrared radiation, but again, we fixed the processing conditions that uh, on the beginning of the process. So this means that things like uh, um, irradiation time or scanning speed is fixed. So the heat produced by the UV radiation or the heat generated by the infrared radiation will be constant throughout the process. So this is uh, one part of the question. Now, this does not mean that uh, the, the temperature will be constant. And effectively, that is not the case. So if you have uh, um, a small volume of polymer being uh, irradiated uh, in that uh, um, element of volume, there is a, a, a variation of temperature. And that is a very interesting question. So before I move to the, to the second and other questions, I would like to ask you, how is the variation of temperature? So again, let me try to draw something. So you have a, a layer and we are starting irradiating the layer. So this is uh, half of, uh, of the volume being irradiated. Now, for example, let's uh, consider a point. I'm going to call point A. I don't know if you can see it. Point A at the top here of the layer, I want to know what is the temperature profile associated to this point A. As in like the temperature at A. Sorry? So the temperature would be highest at A, right? Is that where it's at the top of is at the top surface? Yeah, but uh, let me try to draw something less. So, what I want to know is uh, at point A, what should be the temperature versus irradiation time profile? Okay, and is the radiation is scanning 
to the length of that layer? Uh, yeah, the, the, the laser is scanning, but um, I don't want to know what's happened later in a, a single point. So I'm assuming okay. that uh, the, the laser is uh, irradiating that element or that okay. point during uh, a large period of time, a significant period of time. So the first, the, the first thing uh, uh, to do to start this graph is uh, what is the starting point? So initially the resin is at what temperature? So it'd be at the lowest temperature and then increase? Yeah, but what, what, what is the lowest temperature? Whatever you create it to or? Yeah, whatever. but uh, let's, uh, let's consider a, va a conventional VAT photopolymerization. So the, the, um, the resin is at room temperature. So the resin yes. is initially at room temperature. Now we start the irradiation process. So what's happened to the temperature? So the temperature increases quite rapidly as uh, the reaction, curing reaction starts. This exothermic. Yeah. yeah, correct. That is a very, uh, sorry, I, I, I miss the, it's you, Yusef, that is. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is uh, that is uh, uh, excellent, Yusef. Yes. So we we start at the room temperature. The the laser starts irradiating the material. So the laser produces heat. Um, the radiation starts the polymerization process, but the polymerization reaction, as you know, is an exothermic reaction. So this means that heat is also released from uh, the reaction. Yeah. So this means that uh, the temperature increases rapidly. And then? And then, um, I guess it, it must meet, a, like it reaches a maximum point and then. Yeah, and that, that maximum point corresponds to what? Um, so if you, if you remember the curing, uh, the curing mechanism and in terms of curing, uh, we mentioned three different uh, uh, phenomena that we have uh, in VAT photopolymerization. One is the, the, the so-called uh, induction period. Then we yeah. have uh, gelification. And finally, we have the vitrification. So that yeah. peak, the maximum temperature, corresponds to what? The Emax, like the maximum energy. Yeah, but in terms of the, the, the curing uh, mechanism, oh, that that corresponds to what? Like hundred percent curing, uh, or, or or not? So if uh, if uh, if you if you don't select uh, 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 an, an optimized system and uh, irradiated conditions, uh, mm -hmm. the peak cannot be the corresponding to another percent of solid material, but at least should correspond to the maximum amount of solid material that you can reach during the right. polymerization process which corresponds to the vitrification effect, okay. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's happened after vitrification? So you reach, uh, you reach the, the peak uh, at the vitrification point, and then what's happened? And then uh, it plateaus, the conversion plateaus. Um, you reach like a 90% conversion and then... Yeah, but in terms of temperature, so... So oh, temperature. It's, it's good. So what you are saying is something like that. So we start yeah. at room temperature, then the temperature increases because uh, we are providing heat from the height and uh, it is also released uh, due to the curing reaction and we reach yeah. a maximum and the maximum corresponds to the vitrification point. After this yeah. maximum, what's happened to the temperature? So I guess after that maximum, the exothermic reaction is kind of slowed down. So the yeah. temperature also plateaus or lowers down to um, a more constant value. I'm not sure if it plateaus or continues because if the laser is like still radiating on it, does it still, it's still heating up, but not as fast as it was before? Yeah. 
So what you have is something like this, isn't it? So after the vitrification point, the temperature yeah. starts to decrease because you are releasing uh, less heat from the curing reaction. And then you reach uh, a plateau, you reach an equilibrium state where basically the temperature that you have at uh, that point, point eight, corresponds to the temperature produced by the laser. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, very, 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 very good. Uh, now, you ask also another question, which is in a powder bed fusion lecture. Yes, yeah, so there's this, um, this one slide that had pictures of, I think it was beam overlapping or or something like that, which I wasn't sure if, because um, I don't think you went um, into it in detail. Okay, so I, I don't remember what was the graph. Let me write something to see if it is what you are saying. Or something like that was about the overlap of the beams. Yeah, it was, I think if you move your book up, I, th I think it was. Okay, so what you have uh, here is, uh, so in this case, you don't have uh, any overlap hmm. between beams. So this means that uh, the adhesion between passes is quite low. And you have a significant amount of non-fused powder. So this is not good because this no, does not provide uh, enough strength for your part. Now, right. if you increase the level of overlap, what's happened is that uh, you reduce the amount of uh, non-melted powder and you increase the strength of, um, of, um, of the part. But of mm -hmm. course, you increase also the fabrication time. Okay. Yeah. So basically this was the message. So in a powder bed fusion, and this is also similar to that photopolymerization in the case of laser. So we should have a, a certain level of overlap, which depends on uh, the desired mechanical properties. And if yeah. you want to have uh, a fully dense uh, solid part, we need to guarantee a high level of overlap, but in that case, we need to consider also a high fabrication time. Okay. The overlap is too much. Is it such that the intensity is too high at like a single point? Uh, no, what's, what, what's happened is that uh, you are heating some material that was uh, heated before. So we, okay. the, 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 imagine the, the, the laser scanning uh, the powder layer, yeah, uh, with a with a specific uh, a specific uh, um, uh, speed. Um, so if if the speed is too 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 high, this means that you move from this point to this point. So all of this material will not be submitted to any radiation. So it is non-fused. Oh, yeah. But if your speed is quite low. This means that you have a high level of overlap. So this means that uh, you heat the material, but you keep heating the material slowly uh, during this irradiation process. So mm. this is reflected on the level of uh, uh, overlap of the beams in the, um, in the powder layer. Or again, this is also valid for that photopolymerization, as I mentioned. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor, I had a question. Yep. Um, so this is regarding um, stereothermal lithography. Um, so in your tutorial, uh, you gave us advantages that this process has over the conventional uh, VAT photopolymerization. And you said one of the advantages that this system has more tunability. 
Can you explain what you mean by tunability? Yeah. So when you when you have um, um, a vet photo a, a conventional vet photopolarization system, this means that the system operates with a uh, UV radiation. As a consequence, the pre-polymeric material should contain UV sensitive uh, initiators. Uh, when you move to um, uh, infrared stereolithography, because we are using heat to start the polymerization process, this means that the liquid, uh, the initial liquid uh, uh, photosensitive material should contain uh, only uh, initiator sensitive to heat. When we move to stereothermal lithography, we can use a wide range of uh, initiators. We can use uh, initiators sensitive to UV. We can use initiators sensitive to, um, to um, infrared. So this gives us uh, uh, a wide range of materials that can be used uh, with, uh, uh, that, uh, with st stereothermal lithography. Okay, that makes sense, yeah, thank you. Uh, Hubert is asking, is liquid phase sintering the same as selective laser sintering to produce? Yes, uh, it is. So liquid phase sintering is the, um, the, the scientific term to describe how can we use uh, a powder bed fusion technology operating with uh, a CO2 laser to create uh, metallic uh, parts. So it's the same as SLS to create uh, metallic parts. Uh, uh, Dylan, you are asking in the tutorial, there was a question asking to fill in a table with shrinkers percentage, young models and critical energy. Are there equations for these values or will we be expected to simply recognize typical values? Yeah, so no. So we, we in, in VET photopolymerization, we can use a, a wide range of, um, of materials and combination of materials. So there is no equation saying that in these conditions, epoxy resins presents this uh, um, shrinkage value of these mechanical values. Uh, no. So the only thing that you need to, to know is, uh, okay, in the case of free radical polymerization, um, the material is cheap, but they present a high uh, shrinkage, mechanical properties are lower, um, and the polymerization reaction is uh, inhibited by oxygen. Uh, but the reaction is more uh, efficient. And then based on the, the values for different materials and based on the, the, the knowledge that you have about uh, the free radical polymerization and cationic polymerization, you should be able to identify which materials corresponds to which uh, um, type of polymerization. But there is no, no equation uh, to know or any equation that give us uh, an idea about uh, specific values of shrinkage or specific values of um, mechanical properties. Uh, Albert, sorry, I missed the second, uh, the second part. Does the pre-polymer, oligomer and uh, monomer all mean uh, the same thing? Um, no, no, effectively not. Um, what we what we usually uh, use is the term uh, uh, pre-polymer um, to describe the the initial liquid material. Now, oligomer is the basic uh, unit, so a polymer is formed by many. Uh, sorry, the monomer is the basic unit, so. A polymer is based by, is is formed by many 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 monomers. Uh, what we have in uh, again in a in a in a, um, a vet photopolymerization on the beginning, because we are talking about uh, a liquid material, we are talking about uh, uh, 
small associations of monomers, and these are called oligomers. So we can use the term oligomer or the, the term uh, uh, pre-polymer, um, and both are, both are okay, but monomer is the basic unit. Um, an oligomer is formed by uh, an association of a small number of, um, of um, monomers, and finally, the, the polymer that we obtain uh, after reiteration, um, it's a cross-linked network uh, formed by many, 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 many uh, monomers. Uh, Edira, uh, you mentioned vitrification question mark. I don't know what is the question. Do you mind to, to tell me? Edira, are you there? Yes, sir. I was just answering the previous question that you were asking on the graph. So it wasn't a question, I was just answering your question. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, Mazuk, again, I, I, I don't know what you mean. So you put uh, glass transition higher than uh, temperature of cure. So was this a question? Yeah, that was from before, and I was just answering the question before. Okay. Uh, Yi Chen, in my tutorial question, it mentioned high viscosity resins as the advantage of less shrinkage. Is this because high viscosity resin already has a large amount of cross-link uh, uh, component? Um, no. So what's happened is that uh, the, um, when you have uh, uh, high viscous materials, this means that you are processing a resin with um, large polymer chains. And these large polymer chains um, corresponds to high viscous material. Now, what is the reason for saying that uh, the, vis the, the shrinkage um, is lower if we polymerize a high viscose material compared to a low viscose material. Because basically the, the, the shrinkage corresponds to the difference between the final volume and the initial volume. So if we start with a very liquid material, the difference between the final volume and the initial occupied volume will be significantly higher. And that's why the shrinkage is higher. Is this clear, Ichen? Yeah, it's clear, thanks. It makes sense. Okay, I don't have uh, questions here. So let me, let me ask. Um, uh, professor, I have one quick question I'd like to ask. Yeah. Um, in the past papers, one of the questions asked about, about photopolymerization and the curling and distortion effects that can happen as a result of it, the reasons why it might happen and what you can do to prevent it. Now, in your notes, you talk about how that happens with powder bed fusion, but not explicitly about bat photopolymerization. So how would you answer that question? Okay, so before, before that, um, let me, let me ask uh, something, uh, something else. So let's start with, uh, with, um, with the basics. So I want, to, I want you to describe me the curing uh, kinetics in a VAT photopolymerization process. And uh, I want you to tell me, uh, what are the major effects? What are the major phenomena? And uh, how can we minimize some of those uh, uh, phenomena that we have in the, in the curing reaction uh, by playing with uh, photo-initiated concentration, uh, light intensity, and temperature? 
So before that, uh, that question, I want you to describe me the curing process. So what is curing? What are the main phenomena? Blah, 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 blah. So what is shrinkage? What is shrinkage? What is curing? Come on, you, you, you know. So tell me, one, one of you. You should know, <laughs> by the way, come on. Niarik. Um, yeah, I was just about to unmute myself to answer. I don't know if it's the most accurate one, but I guess uh, how curing works is you have your pre-polymers and then your photo initiators. You shine light on it. It could be UV or infrared. And that, uh, that, that essentially kicks off the photo initiators to start the curing process, which is when the pre-polymers solidify into the final polymer that we want. As far as the kinetics go, initially the curing isn't that quickly because of induction time, which is when I think when the photo initiators receive the light, they're inhibited by oxygen or other molecules. But once you cross the induction time, then the reaction rate really starts to increase until you hit. Uh, I think that I think that's called gelation. Uh, maybe maybe not. I'm not too sure. Gelation but that happens. That's the initial point, yeah. Yeah, so and then the induction time, you have gelation where. The reaction starts and starts uh, uh, very fast. Um, yeah, and Next. following that happens until you reach vitrification, which is uh, when the glass transition temperature is now more than the temperature of the polymers currently in. At that point, the rate of the reaction uh, drops dramatically. It still continues, but not as much as it once was. And if you have, was the follow-up question what the effects of light intensity and photo initiators and those parameters are. Okay. Now, throughout the process, that process, what's happened to viscosity, to density, mechanical properties, and shrinkage? Um, viscosity probably decreases because once the more it solidifies, the more viscous and thick it becomes. That's how I'm seeing it in my head. So viscosity increases, not decreases. I think increases, but I'm not. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, it, it, it is correct, increases. But um, I, I, I think that you mentioned decreases. I said increases. Sorry about that. Yeah. Then mechanical so properties, uh, they increase as well because more cross-linking occurs, stronger molecular bonds. You need more strength to break it. So. Yeah. What um, about uh, shrinkage? Shrinkage, as in the rate of shrinkage, or just how what how much it shrinks or doesn't shrink? What exactly? No, the overall the overall value of shrinkage. Um, there is, I think, there is some shrinkage that will occur because if cross-linking occurs, then the then the substance becomes more dense, and that means the volume decreases. So this means that uh, shrinkage increases throughout the curing uh, reaction or decreases. The total amount of shrinkage increases. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Now, in the case of that photopolymerization, we are doing this layer by layer, which means that uh, we polymerize one layer and then we move to the next layer. So during the polymerization of the second layer, what's happened is that uh, the material undergoes that phase change transformation that you described. So moving from a liquid state into a solid state. And because of that, the material shrinkage. But in this case, the material shrinkage on top of a previously 
irradiated layer. What is the effect of that shrinkage mechanism on the second layer in terms of the, 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 the previously polymerized layer? Wait, so are we assuming that the second layer is yet to be cured or has it already been cured? Already cured. So the first layer was cured. Then we irradiate the second layer, polymerizing the second layer. And uh, during this polymerization process, we have a shrinkage phenomena because the material is moving from a liquid state into a solid state. Right, so if there's shrinkage from the bottom, then there'd be some internal stresses acting on the top of it. Yep, so again, uh, let me see if I, if I can uh, write this properly. Sorry, I'm, I'm terrible with uh, with drawings, but uh, <laughs> the idea is this. So we polymerize uh, one layer, and now we are polymerizing the second layer. So shrinkage is occurring because we are transforming a liquid material into a solid one on top of a previously solid layer. So this means that uh, this polymerization process on the second layer will induce stresses on the first layer. Bending. Uh, the structure like I represented here. So this is the curl effect. So basically the curling in vet, in vet photopolymerization, and this is only visible when we consider a very large um, object, but uh, curling or curl, the curl effects, are related to the shrinkage phenomena and uh, the stresses between these two layers because one was already polymerized and the other one is being polymerized and shrinking. So this is the, 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 the reason for curling. Now, because this curl effect is due to shrinkage, how can we minimize the curl effect? Perhaps by using smaller layers? Uh, no, not really, because you, you will have the same effect. So you polymerize one layer, even if uh, a thinner one, but it will be solid or more or less solid. And then we'll polymerize the, the, the next one. So you will have the same effect, especially if you keep uh, the layers, uh, large layers. But one, one, it's, one it's simple. So how can, how can I guarantee that uh, the layers are not moving up? With support structures. Okay. Using support structures, correct. So if we create support structures, we'll guarantee that uh, you don't have this curl effect. So one, uh, mechanism to minimize curling is to use uh, support structures to anchor the down facing surface uh, of these um, of these layers now i mentioned that this is particularly critical for large flat horizontal surfaces so if in that case i reorient the part having uh, small layers instead of large ones, I will be able to minimize this effect. So orientation or reorientation of the, of the part can be, depending, but can be also one possibility. And there is a, a, a third, uh, a third, uh, uh, approach to minimize uh, curling, which you must know because you have already mentioned before. So if you increase shrink, so the curling increases if you have a high shrinkage. 
So a mechanism to minimize curling is to reduce shrinkage. How can I reduce shrinkage? We can use have high higher viscosity. Using a high viscosity material, yeah. So if you use a high viscosity material, we'll reduce shrinkage. But if you use a high viscosity materials, you will have uh, other problems associated. And by the way, what are the main problems associated with the use of a high viscosity uh, resin? Air bubbles. Air bubbles. High and, recoat times. And uh, um, high recoating time. Yeah, correct. So in summary, curling is related to shrinkage and uh, particularly to the stresses between these two layers due to the fact that the previous layer was already uh, solidified and the second one is being solidified and shrinking on top of the, the, the previously uh, irradiated layer. And uh, there are basically three approaches to minimize uh, curling in VET photopolymerization. One is to reorient the, the parts, avoiding to have large horizontal layers and uh, the second one is to use uh, high viscosity resins, but knowing that by using high viscosity resins, we may have other problems like uh, entrapped air bubbles and uh, high recoating times. And uh, the third one is by using uh, support, um, support uh, structures. Um, Okay, very good. I, yeah. Uh, before I, I, I ask uh, other questions, I, I, I want to, 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 to remind you one or two things. Um, okay, so for example, I, I'm finishing marking um, the bioengineering part. And uh, th th there are no, no, no surprises. So basically, uh, persons that uh, attended the lectures and uh, yeah, were able to understand the questions, they have done pretty well, at least in, in the bioengineering part. The problem was the students that didn't attend the lectures and uh, some of them uh, uh, attended the, the the lecture that I, I, I gave uh, before the exam. So they pick some ideas and uh, they try to use those ideas, but in a, in a not coherent uh, way. So please uh, revise everything uh, and don't try to, to pick up those uh, ideas and to put those ideas without any, any proper explanation. So please explain things. Uh, properly in the exam. But, um, but again, based on uh, what I saw in the other exam, people that attended, and this is also my experience, so people that attended the lectures, people that uh, were able to answer the questions, they will not have any problems with the exam. Uh, and by the way, the exam will something that um, once you, you, you open the exam, you'll see, oh, Okay, I was expecting something like that. So it will not be um, a surprise. Well, <clears throat> we, we study in the, in the lecture several um, additive manufacturing technologies. So we study VET photopolymerization, extrusion, material jetting, uh, binder jetting, uh, powder bed fusion, direct energy deposition. Yeah, that's it. Um, so among all of these uh, techniques, I want to know which techniques require support structures. Oh, 
hot or bad fusion. Sorry, it's my computer telling the, the, the time. Sorry, Nan. Uh, powder bed fusion. Powder bed fusion requires support structures. Uh, always? No, just for the metal. Just for metals, correct. Any other technologies? Uh, extruder based processes you usually get two printing heads, one support structures and one with the main material. Yeah, extrusion requires support structures. Any other technology? Yeah, VET photopolymerization, uh, Goa Younger is, uh, is saying, correct. Now, imagine that I want to create uh, a metallic uh, structure with uh, functional graded properties. What is or what are the right technologies to do that? Direct energy deposition. Direct energy deposition, correct. And uh, by, by, by the way, why? Why is it possible to create a functional graded object using direct energy deposition? Uh, is it because these machines like have more than one uh, deposition head, so multiple materials can be yeah multiple nozzles uh, supplying different materials? Correct. Um, now, imagine that uh, okay, among all of the technologies that we 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 discussed, um, what is the ideal technology for repair applications? Uh, still direct energy deposition. Direct energy deposition, correct. Um, what are the technologies that allow us to create color parts? Flat photopolymerization, um, also material extrusion. Only? We find the jetting. We and by the that. jetting, yes, it is, Lewis, because we can use uh, multiple jets and uh, different types of uh, colored uh, inks. Now, you mentioned uh, VET photopolymerization. Yes, so it is possible to create color parts using VET photopolymerization, limited number of colors. But uh, my question is, how? Because it seems strange. As we are using uh, an initial uh, a liquid uh, material on a vat, and uh, we radiate uh, the material. So how can we create uh, color parts using uh, vat photopolymerization? We can use add, uh, different pigments. Yeah. Yeah, using different pigments. And how can we activate those different pigments? They require different energy levels supplied. Yeah, correct. And uh, how can we control the um, level of energy supplied to the resin by controlling what? Light intensity. Light intensity, yeah. And uh, how can we control light intensity? Scanning speed. So yeah. if you increase the scanning speed, uh, you decrease the, the energy supplied to the material if you decrease the scanning speed because you are, you, you, you are irradiating uh, uh, a specific point more time, uh, the energy is uh, um, increasing. Okay, very, 
is very good. Um, um, okay, what is uh, what? Um, What are conformal cooling channels? And what are the advantages of uh, having uh, conformal cooling channels? So isn't that like the cooling channels that conform to the geometry of the cart? Yeah. And if, uh, this, is, this gives like a much higher and more efficient cooling for that part. Yeah, correct. And uh, so the cooling channels are conform to the to the shape of the the mold cavity uh, improves the the heat removal from the cavity and uh, what is the effect of that in terms of part quality well, as you get decreased warp and shrinkage because you get uniform temperatures yeah the part quality will be um, improved um Okay. We we talk about so in terms of the of the information flow, you know that the the main steps are the generation of the CAD model, STL file, slice file generation, uh, G code, and then. Uh, Printing in them in the machine. Uh, I want to know what are the major limitations of uh, an STL file. Um, it doesn't contain any. Information of the material properties or colors or things like that. Yeah, so it's pure geometric. Would it be like um, getting steps on kind of features? Uh, so the level of approximation can be a problem. Yes, because uh, as you know, especially in the Husky file format, there is uh, a significant amount of redundant information. So the size of the files are quite high. Um, so we tend to use um, less elements, and this compromises the um, the, um, the accuracy. Um, now, does it have information on color and material properties? Uh, material properties, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it was mentioned, but uh, Edira, and uh, this is also pointed by um, Goi Ong. Can we use ST, an STL file to create a color part or not? No, that's why I just mentioned that I said color and material properties. I thought it does allow you to print color. It has like extra two bytes or something. Yeah. So please check uh, the first slides on the last lecture. I think uh, I'm not sure if it was, it, it was lecture 11. So I mentioned that uh, in the case of uh, a binary file, because of the structure of the binary file, there are always two bytes free. And uh, people are using those two bytes to incorporate uh, color information. So in a, an ASCII file format, it's not possible to include color. But in the binary file, it is possible to include uh, to include color. So please check. Uh, I think it was uh, lecture eleven. It was the the, the last lecture, and um, I presented uh, one slide with the structure of the 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 STL binary file structure, highlighting. Uh, 
the the two the, the bytes uh, the three bytes uh, available for color specification so this is um, this is important now but uh, material properties is correct so it's uh, material independent now imagine that you want to create a structure like this made with uh, one material material a and material b so using this approach stl slice g code generation how can i send the how can i create an object like that using additive manufacturing would you need two different stl files yes in a case like this we need to consider two different stl files one STL for material A, one STL for material B. And then we need to assign STL A to a specific uh, printing head and uh, STL B to a different uh, printing, uh, printing head. Um, Okay, uh, so again, returning to the different technologies that we, 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 we discuss, um, which technologies are suitable to process uh, thermos, thermoplastic materials? Extrusion. Extrusion, yeah. Only extrusion. Also SLS. Yeah, powder bed fusion, yeah. SLS in particular, because yeah, it's the one using a CO2 laser. So extrusion, SLS. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Find the jetting. By the jetting is also uh, an option because we can use uh, a thermoplastic uh, powder and then we use the, the, um, the binder to, to aggregate, to glue this thermo thermoplastic uh, powder. Uh, now, considering uh, powder bed fusion, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, Guay. No, that photopolymerization it's only for thermosetting materials because uh, they require a polymerization reaction. So thermoplastics are processed only by heating and cooling down. So you are saying that there are thermoplastic resins. Now, in in some cases, so for for example, for infrared stereolithography or um, stereothermal lithography, we can use uh, thermal sensitive uh, uh, pre-polymers, which means that they have uh, initiators that will start the reaction once uh, uh, a specific level of energy is provided, but they are not thermoplastics. They are thermosetting materials with specific photo initiators. Um, now, let's uh, let's consider the 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 powder bed the, the powder bed fusion. As um, as you know, there are different uh, approaches in um, in um, in powder bed fusion. Um, one approach, it's um, only suitable for conductive 
materials, for conductive metallic materials, which is that uh, technology. Electron beam. Electron beam. Can you, can you tell me what are the major differences between uh, IBM and um, SLM? So electron beam melting it needs a vacuum, whereas laser sintering needs an inert gas in terms of atmosphere. Um, electron beam melting is less accurate. Uh, laser sintering is more accurate. Um, electron beam melting has a poorer surface finish, whereas laser sintering has a better surface finish. Uh, laser sintering also has a higher energy cost. Electron beam melting is relatively cheaper. Um, that's about all I could think of here. Okay. Um, now, um, regarding again to the to the information flow. Um, so we have uh, the CAD model, the STL, the, the slice, G code generation. Um, we mentioned two different approaches for slicing. What are those? two main approaches and uh, what are the advantages of one over the other? So there's your standard approach, which is uniform slicing, where each layer has the same thickness. Then there's adaptive slicing, which is harder to implement in a machine, but uh, the layer thickness changes based on the geometry of the model. Um, and uh, what is the, the advantage of that? If you use adaptive slicing, you don't have the staircase effect that you would have yeah. with the slicing. Yeah, so the accuracy, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's higher. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, yeah, okay. So, check again the, um, the equations that I mentioned. Um, if, if, um, if I explain, uh, if I ask you to explain uh, something, uh, so for example, describe uh, the extrusion-based process, uh, please detail your answer, uh, don't mention, only extrusion is a process that uh, transforms the thermoplastic material uh, layer, creating layer by layer a three-dimensional object. No, provides more information. Create a sketch uh, illustrating the, 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 the process. So if I ask you, please uh, describe the information flow uh, when you present the, 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 the STL files, for example, uh, provide the, the, the structure of the STL file. The STL file in an ASCII file format um, starts with this, uh, ends with that. So detail your, your information. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's it. I, I, yeah, you, you attended the lectures. Um, I have no doubts that um, at least from, uh, from the additive manufacturing side, it will be it will be okay. Uh, you will not have uh, any any problems. And um, personally, I, I think that the exam is not very is, it, the exam is not difficult, basically. Any other questions? Uh, so this is not to do with the exam. Uh, I was just wondering. Um, we got our marks back for the coursework, but there doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be any feedback. It's just the mark. And there's no like feedback attached to the report. Uh, okay, yeah, because it was uploaded in the blackboard. Um, so, Chazan, if you don't mind, uh, drop an email to me and to to and to Professor Charlie Wong. Okay. 
okay. the feedback. Uh, Sir, for question eight in the last lecture, lesson 11, um, there is an issue with the equation. Uh, the, the result you gave is not correct. You put 2.761 times 10 to the minus eight centimeters cubed. Uh, it's actually 2.21 times 10 to the minus seven. So the like the, um, the answer is incorrect for the question eight, lesson 11. Okay. Yeah, if that is the case, I'm very, very sorry. Let me try to open my disk. Uh, what what is the question number? Question eight. Oh, sorry. I opened the PDF without the answer. So let me. Uh, Dylan, can you repeat? Where is the error? Sorry, I'm I'm looking to the to the slide now. Lesson eleven, question eight. Yeah, and where is the the, the error? I don't so, have a, a, a machine with, with me. Sorry. Oh, it, it's where it says estimate the number of particles in four hundred in a four hundred gram sample of iron powder. That one, the volume you extract. Everything else is correct. The volume is wrong though. It should be 2.21 times 10 to the minus seven, not 2.761 times 10 to the minus eight. Okay. Okay. I will, I will check again, sorry. If it is wrong, I'm very sorry for that. So it is this one, yeah? Yeah, this yeah, one. thank you. Okay, okay. I will check, sorry. Any other questions? No? Okay, so exam at nine, um, I wish uh, all the best for the, for the exam. It will be okay. Um, yeah, in... Uh, more descriptive um, uh, descriptive um, questions. Detail your answer. Uh, and uh, by the end of the exam, drop me an email to say if it was okay, if it went well, um, to, to know. And I sent a, 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 an email this afternoon with um, with the explanations, so we know that the exam is three hours, you have uh, one hour extra time to scan and upload. And of course, uh, DISS students have uh, extra, extra time. Any other questions? If not, we will end now. Again, good luck for tomorrow.
it's not necessary because uh, because you I, I think that you are ready to the exam. Um, revisit the, the, the questions that uh, we discussed today. And uh, again, e even if necessary, write your, your answer um, because sometimes, uh, especially, which I'm not saying this is the case, but especially if you do, didn't attend to the lectures, sometimes the students try to pick up some, some ideas based what, on what we mentioned, and uh, then it, it, it's a mess, the, the, the explanation. So if this is the case, try to write the, the, the answers to the questions that we, 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 we discussed uh, discuss today. Uh, the rest, uh, it, 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 it's fine. So all explanatory discussion, uh, questions detail your answer and it will be 